Hey boys and girls, uh, welcome back to uh, Monroe Live. And today what we're gonna do is kinda like a re-release of something because um, I really think that it's important that we talk a little bit more about the other aspects of, um, of electrification. Um, the biggest polluters, individual polluters of products, or sorry, the atmosphere, are, um, are usually these big gigantic mining operations. In those mining operations, what happens is you get gigantic trucks. And that's why I'm re-releasing this thing because Pat Caterpillar makes quite a number of these huge trucks. And they're moving in the direction of electrification and autonomy. Autonomy is a good idea for trucks because it'll drop the amount of um, accidents that happen. This, uh, this type of trucking is vastly different than anything else. It's really important that we understand that We've been in this business for quite a while, since World War II. Um, huge uh, trucks have been out there trying to um, basically mine at an efficient rate. By having truck drivers, I don't want to say eliminated, but taken out of the equation in many operations, this is going to be big for the, the safety of these uh, big giant machines, the safety of the people who are driving the trucks, and the safety of those who are in the mines and in around those areas. The other thing I'm personally connected to, my dad, um, uh, my dad worked for a guy named Gar Wood. Gar Wood had an operation in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Gar Wood was the guy that invented, um, he invented the hydraulic cylinder, the dump truck, what we would classify as a, as a garbage truck right now, but is really called a load crusher on and on and on. Garwood was definitely an American genius. He doesn't get much uh, credit except for the hydroplane boats that he, uh, that he uh, helped out. Uh, he invented those as well. But he was really a genius in his, in his time. Um, I, uh, we're showing you a picture right now of my dad standing next to a hook, a hook that was used for tires uh, when, uh, when they were building those trucks in Windsor, Ontario at the uh, Garwood plant. I, uh, I'm very, very interested in these kinds of things. I'm very interested in how we can look at all the aspects associated with electric vehicles. And these gigantic operations are definitely something we should be looking at. And it looks a lot like uh, Caterpillar is leading the way there. So what I'd like to do is re-release this. Please have a look at uh, what came about here with uh, my interview at Caterpillar. I think it's really worth your, your time. Thanks very much and enjoy the show. And we're ready to go. Hey boys and girls, welcome back to Monroe Live. And uh, if, as you can see, I'm standing next to a big wheel and a second big wheel, here's Jag. So Jag and I are gonna talk to you a little bit today about what's the future like for the mining industries. Now, you might think that this is a big truck. If you look down there and you look up here, my God, this thing looks huge. But this is one of the smaller ones. That's right. So I know about a little bit about these kinds of vehicles because a long time ago when I was a kid, um, there was a company called Phil Wood and they made gigantic trucks for the mining industry in Quebec, in Quebec, Canada. And there's a picture of me and my dad. And my dad and I are right here on that truck. That wheel was made special for this truck. And I, I'm like 10 years old and I'm going uh, like this and my dad's got his arms folded and we're standing beside the wheel and you can see that much of, of the truck. It was huge. So anyways, I've always been fascinated by gigantic, by gigantic uh, uh, trucks like this. 
And so today, Jag is going to talk to us a little bit about what's the next generation, the next generation of efficiencies for trucks like this. And uh, and it's autonomy, right? So yeah, autonomy is the future. So Caterpillar has actually been in the automated automation or technology business for about the last 30 years, 1980, working with GPS. And we actually showcased the two autonomous trucks in a quarry environment in Mine Expo 1996. But the technology wasn't quite there. A lot of mechanical buttons to get things going. And then we got into the DARPA challenge. And that's where we partnered with Carnegie Mellon and kind of developed some of this technology from them. And then we came second and first, I believe. No kidding. So, is this 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 uh, this truck right here? This is set up for autonomy. Yes, this is actually going to a quarry site, Luxstone. It's a family-owned, probably one of the largest family-owned quarry and aggregate uh, sites companies, and this is actually heading there. So this okay. is the start of it. And this, like you mentioned, this is one of our smaller trucks, hundred ton short ton uh, payload capacity, and we go up to four hundred twenty tons. Four hundred twenty. So it'd be basically for. Four times yeah, so, the size of this. Yeah, if you look at this, is about 15 feet tall, about 17 feet wide, and our largest truck is about 22 feet tall and about 34 feet wide. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you're not probably going to park that in your uh, in your driveway. No, and customers, you know, what's interesting about automation and the Caterpillar truck and the brand itself is these trucks. This is how companies make money, right? Yeah. And these run 24/7. So these not only does the hardware have to be robust but all the components and we actually been running for the last 10 years and a lot of people don't know that and that's why we're here yeah well i'll tell you um letting everybody know is a good thing a better thing though is the actual uh, technology itself and here's the deal um when you have trucks like this and they're carrying heavy loads and they're in a i would say a very dangerous environment having uh, having an operator there sometimes isn't your best option Sometimes people get tired. <laughs> Sometimes they sneak in drunk. All kinds of things can happen. So at the end of the day, having something like this that's running autonomously could make a huge difference, a huge difference in your efficiency in getting the job done. Not only that, as you move through uh, uh, different different tracks and whatnot inside the uh, inside the, uh, the, the the mine open pit or or in a in a mine shaft. The other thing that happens is you've, you've also got uh, the uh, the ability to run into a wall or something. In this case, with autonomy, it's all it's all done someplace. You hit on two important things: safety and productivity. Yeah. Right. I've actually driven one of our largest trucks in a productive environment before we rolled out autonomy, so I understood what the safety benefits are. And when you're operating these trucks on a 12-hour shift, I have two breaks. 20 minute lunch, you're not running to get back into this truck to be productive. Yeah. At the start of the shift, you're super productive, but at the end of it, you get tired, you get yeah, fatigued, yeah. you slow right. down. And then when you get into nighttime dri driving or operation, the radio chatter goes down and you're wondering if people are paying attention. And yeah. these trucks, they don't, they don't care, right? There's right. nobody in the cab. And if you look at automation and uh, other companies out there, we have a cab, but these trucks have nobody in them. So let me There's ask, nobody to intervene. I was I was going to ask about that. If it's autonomous, why why build a cab? The cab is expensive. We worked on actually your cab to cost reduce them and whatnot. But if if there's nobody in it, why bother? Well, uh, customers want to have the flexibility to be able to operate the truck. And if there's a mechanical breakdown on the truck, they can kind of get it on a low blend and take it off as well. And there's probably certain applications to put quick gravel down. It's easier to just throw somebody in there and put it down and get them out of there. And you can actually switch these trucks between autonomous and manned or staffed operation easily. There's a switch in the cab and you just push it and you're ready to go. Well, I think that'd be a great for a start, but ultimately, yeah. Anyway, and it'd be a cost reduction. Can we go upstairs and have a peek? Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's go up and see what we can uh, do. <sighs> So as you can see, here's some of our components. We have high precision GPS. That would be way up there. Yep, and then we got our, our LiDAR system, and you've probably seen this before, yeah. but CAD has the IP for this in mining. And we've hardened this over the last 10 years because it has to be robust. It has to run 24 seven, and we can't have this coming down because of the LiDAR. So like we said, we have our own IP. We actually train our LiDAR as well, like fog, dust, rain, you know, dense snow. Because this run, running in the oil sands where it gets to like minus 40 C, which is 40, right, minus yeah, 40, yeah. this has to run. And then we have Western Australia where it gets super dusty and, yeah. and you have the fog conditions. So 
we've gathered a lot of data and we train our LIDAR. Yeah. So before it was primary, we got radar as well. Yeah. Used to be pretty primary, but now we have LIDAR as our primary driver and laid the uh, radar for long range. Just out of curiosity, um, iron dust and radar usually, or LIDAR, doesn't really get along. How do you get around the, uh, the issues associated with iron dust? So I would say time. So when we started 10 years ago, we'd stop, slow down a lot for the dust piles of density. But now with the combination or the uh, sensor fusion of these two, yeah. we, and the training of the LiDAR, we can map through it pretty quickly. Well, I don't want to hold up the line. Maybe we could just sneak it. Oh, we didn't sneak fast enough. <laughs> Yeah, so it looks like any other cab that we have. And, and uh, you know, we just have a switch right here to switch between autonomous and manual. Okay. Pretty forward like that, pretty easy. So this is an emergency stop button. Yep. What would that be for? If, you, if, you, if you're driving and doing um, test cycles or something and you need to hit the stop, stop the truck, you just hit that button. Mm, okay. When we're doing some validation. It's because this is one of our trucks that are as our Tucson Proving Grounds where we do all our validation. So this is a validation truck. So as soon as it's done here, we're going to send it straight in the dirt. Okay, so right here we've got a couple of screens. Um, I'm not sure about this truck, but I know that <clears throat> in some of the trucks I've been in, this would give you um, a visual of what's going on at the usually the front wheels or something like that. Is that what's happening here? Yeah, these are mainly displays for different functions for the when you're staffed or manually operating the truck. Yeah, and they have object detection when you're driving it staffed. It shows up the camera if there's a uh, if we have radars on the side. If it picks up something, it kind of shows what's out there. Yeah, yeah. So when this is running autonomously, uh, is it uh, is it true autonomy or is it like uh, like a drone where you're you're manipulating it in a in a in an area somewhere other than the truck. So when a truck gets to a loader and the material falls in the bed, the truck knows what material it is, and then we have an overarching assignment engine because the material has to go to certain dumps or right. crushers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then it gets an assignment from our assignment engine, and then it makes its way to the. So it's making it. It is totally autonomous. Then it's not. It's not, uh, it's not being uh, manually adjusted. No, nope, it's fully autonomous. And like with other autonomous vehicles out there, you have Google Maps or something to get you from point A to B. Yeah, right. So we, that doesn't exist in mining environment. Right. So we have a virtual map of the lanes and the truck knows how to get from A to B. And as it's getting to critical intersections, it'll ask the assignment engine, is this the best path for me to go? There may be a larger queue at one place. And if it's not, it'll reroute it to another destination. So. I see. So underground, uh, would would the same system work? Like uh, you now, you got dirt all the way around. What, yeah, what do you the, do there? That is like a um, for surface uh, automation. You have to have open sky to satellite technology, right. and you can also do dead reckoning for a few seconds as well. Uh, but underground is like their own ground based uh, GPS system. So, anyways, um, it sounds like uh, we've got to move. But uh, but anyways, again, this is a very expensive cab, and sooner or later, I'm sure this is going to disappear and uh, it'll save you a shitload of money. So anyway, let's, uh, let's get out along out of here and uh, let's talk a little bit about maybe the future. Okay, so we, uh, we had a chance to look at what's existing today with CAT, with the autonomous driving vehicle and stuff like that. But really and truly, um, every government on the planet, every government on the planet wants to get rid of these magnificent, gigantic diesel engines and put something else in place. So has CAT looked at anything down the road that, that might be like this? Yeah, so we actually showcased our prototype battery electric truck. It's our 250 ton truck. Uh, we actually showcased it about a month ago. Oh yeah. And we're, yeah, we're gonna do early stage testing next year at actual mine site. Cool. So on that early stage truck, um, I'm pretty sure you're not gonna have enough batteries to put in it. So. What type of charging? Are you going to use a line charger or is it going to be... Exactly in, line. Yeah. Yeah. So you charge while moving pretty much what we're going to yeah. do. So we can harness some of that energy uh, going uphill and then charge the batteries while we're going downhill. Yeah. And, and that's actually what we found when Corey and I crossed about the, the Rocky Mountain. Actually, we, we had several different mountain ranges going up, sucked it dry. Coming down, we wound up with free energy. We, uh, we, we got what we gave away almost. So we, there was a, re, a reduction, but in essence, I think we were down about, um, I don't know, 10 whatever percent going up. 
ten percent. When when we got back down, I think we were at forty. Yeah, we actually have some trucks that run on trolley at a mining yeah. site that electric drive. Yeah, and uh, that's running successfully as well. And that's something we already have the the uh, experience behind. So now we're just taking it to the battery level. Well, I'll tell you what. If you can do something to get rid of diesel fuel, uh, okay. So I'm sure that foremen and the superintendents and whatnot they love diesel. Yeah. But everybody that's higher level hates them. And the reason for that is because it's the number one expensive, hard to get, always a problem. Uh, you uh, gotta fuel. truck it in. You gotta and truck it in. some of these mine sites, it's yeah, not and, close and to the city. They are not close to anything. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I've been to Valio in Brazil and uh, seen a couple of their, and Valio owns gigantic, uh, gigantic uh, dams where they make hydroelectricity. That would be the ideal. And they're so right next door to the so it I would be the that. ideal situation. Exactly. So, if you can do hydroelectric and battery technology, that's emissions yeah. right there goes to zero. So right now, uh, and by the way, that would not disappear. This yeah. part would stay there. Uh, you'd still have to have these enormous, ginormous uh, suspension systems and whatnot. And by the way, for those uh, folks that said, well, you know, you can't really use air pressure to for, for a, an F-150 or whatever. Just have a look at this. Hmm, I wonder what that is. Anyhow, so anyways, Jake, I'd really like to thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for, for this wonderful tour. Oh, thanks for stopping and, uh, by. And I and, watch your show, so this is great. Yes, and that's why I got him. <laughs> the other guys are old, they, they, don't, they don't catch on. So only Jay, yeah. And is this getting him a promotion or getting him fired? Oh, we, we haven't figured it out yet. But anyways, at the end of the day, Jake, thanks so much. And I'd also like to thank our friends at Cat Caterpillar for allowing us to get in here and get up close and, and get up as close as you can to a monster sized truck like this. Thanks for watching uh, Monroe Live uh, here in Las Vegas at the uh, Consumer Electronics Show. Thanks and keep watching. See and you later. thanks again. No problem.